Fluoride is known to elicit numerous ill effects in organism. The primary excretion pathway for fluoride is the kidney, making them susceptible to its impact. In minor quantities, they are essential for dental and bone enamel for mineralization, forming fluor appetite. However, chronic exposure becomes toxic, leading to fluorosis. Studies have indicated that fluoride can elevate blood glucose levels and disrupt glucose tolerance, possibly by impeding insulin production or secretion. Let's delve into the intricate relationship between fluorosis and the blood glucose regulation with our esteemed guest, Professor Dr. Shashidhar Nagaraj. He is a professor and head of department of biochemistry at uh, Sri Devraj URS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Karnataka. With a profound research interest, Dr. Nagaraj has authored over 70 journal articles. We are truly honored to have you with us today, Dr. Shashidhar. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so let's start the session. So, Doctor, you can proceed uh, to share your presentation. I thank the MedSynapse community for giving me an opportunity to say a few things about the dimensions in fluorosis. Myself, uh, Dr. Shashidhar K, Professor and uh, Head of the Department of uh, Biochemistry, being the lead director of uh, fluorosis research and referral laboratory which has been established in the uh, polar which is to the eastern part of the karnataka india we have started this fluorosis uh, research and referral lab with a concern that the fluoride has a uh, uh, lot of impact on the local population so the uh, local population were suffering from the skeletal fluorosis in addition to the skeletal fluorosis it has been observed in the local population that the non-skeletal fluorosis also has become very rampant with respect to the local population. The uh, younger generation of the age of around uh, 20 to 30 years have started getting diabetes more in this local population and as a victim it has been observed that one in three uh, patients who visited the hospital had diabetes. Here the complications of the diabetes particularly the micropathies there is the diabetic nephropathy has become very rampant in this local population being the groundwater level which has crossed more than 1300 feet due to the decreased rainfall and various other things the minimum water fluoride level is supposed to be 0.2 ppm for which initially the uh, toothpaste and other things were added with the fluoride now the fluoride level in the local in the local water has crossed more than 4.1 ppm despite taking a lot of uh, issues pertaining to the uh, fluoride filtration and various other things. The point of concern for today's discussion is chronic exposure to the fluoride. Will it affect the intricate mechanisms involved in the blood sugar regulation at the molecular and cellular levels? And the various uh, populations and the individuals with pre-existing diabetes are those with compromised kidney function. Were they susceptible to the detrimental effects of the fluorosis on the blood glucose regulation and other things? The potential long-term consequences of the fluoride with respect to the impact on the blood glucose regulation, fluoride exposure and fluorosis on the intricate balance of uh, the uh, sugar regulation in individuals with pre-existing metabolic conditions. As we all know that the diabetes is a metabolic disease affecting the various uh, multi-organs are involved with respect to this. And uh, any notable interactions or the synergistic effects between the chronic uh, fluoride exposure, hormonal regulation, enzymatic activities and various other genetic exposures and various other things. There are various recent advances that has been made in illustrating the underlying molecular mechanisms by which the fluoride induced changes in cellular signaling pathways has affect uh, the blood glucose regulation and there are various recommendations that has been made with respect to the intervent interventions and the treatment strategies. There are various gaps and limitations despite the lot of research that has been carried out with respect to the fluorosis and the preventive and various other management approaches needs to be concerned. So with this, let me give a brief introduction about the fluoride, the molecule of interest for today's discussion. It is the 13th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. It exists as a fluorine in nature. It is one of the few elements that have been shown to cause significant effects. The various sources that are related with the fluoride include the drinking water, the air, the dental products, foods and beverages. In the periodic table, if you see 
it occupies the 17th column of the periodic table and it uh, there are various types of fluorosis that has been documented the skeletal non skeletal dental fluorosis of which it is the non skeletal fluorosis which we are concerned of because the skeletal and the dental fluorosis has been studied worldwide and lot of studies has been done and lot of research has been done the non skeletal uh, fluorosis includes the disorders that are related to the intelligent quotient in case of children thyroid disorders early uh, diabetic cataract and uh, hearing uh, deficits with respect to the children autism thyroid disorders cardiovascular disorders gastrointestinal disorders and uh, reproductive system is also involved with this and uh, various other things um, uh, musculoskeletal disorders are also involved with respect to the non skeletal fluorosis so these things made us important in uh, to study the various uh, impacts of the fluorosis on the non skeletal particularly the non uh, bone related because the bone related things has already been known that it will lead to the bolex and uh, various other things the mechanisms of the dental fluorosis also has been studied in depth where the action of fluoride on the proteinase enzymes which are responsible for the enamel's organic matrix synthesis uh, inhibits the uh, resulting in precipitation of the amelogenin which is required for the formation of the plaque and various other things so these things made us to take a study on the non skeletal uh, fluorosis as the fluoride is known to damage the dna of the cells in organs which are involved in the metabolism which are which results in the mutations in the signaling pathways of the enzymes and proteins leading to the metabolic damage and depreciation in normal cell functioning so these mutations which where exactly the mutation lies and is there any impact of the fluoride on the various other metal ions for example the magnesium manganese and various other things the phosphate ions are it also involved with the dna damage and other things needs to be studied which we are concentrating more on this the non skeletal fluorosis as i have already mentioned it has got an impact on the cns uh, uh, be it uh, alzheimer's disease be it intelligent quotient be it uh, various other parkinsons and various other things stroke depression psychosis and various other things cardiovascular diseases such as the coronary heart disease ischemic heart disease renal ischemia calculus and various other things gastrointestinal starting from acid peptic disease to the cancers hematological uh, conditions including the various uh, anemias hemoglobinopathies and various other things reproductive system starting from infertility to the cervical cancer we have touched upon this is my team which includes dr muni lakshmi myself dr sai dipika and uh, uh, indumati uh, in addition to that uh, we have uh, uh, sharan with us dr sharan with us so these are the instrumentations that we are using with respect to the fluoride estimation this is ion selective electrode uh, which has been uh, procured from the thermo scientific uh, orion star and uh, uh, this is uh, done with uh, the help of the tsa buffer total ionic uh, strength acid buffer is the one that we use and uh, we have a ph meter and centrifuge so this is in brief presentation about the fluorosis research that we are taking upon in our center now over to ma'am uh, for any queries and questions you can please go ahead with uh, the questions so um i wanted to ask like based on the latest research findings how substantial is the impact of chronic fluoride exposure and fluorosis on the intricate balance of blood sugar regulation in individuals without pre existing metabolic condition ma'am it has been documented that the fluoride has got an impact on an enzyme called as the enolase and there is a effect in the enzyme activity that whenever the enolase enzyme is inhibited with respect to the glycolysis glycolysis is a mechanism where the glucose will be broken down into pyruvate or lactate depending on the aerobic and anaerobic condition so based on this the enolase enzyme that is when it is inhibited there is a competition between the fluoride and the magnesium ion to bind at the active site of the enolase enzyme instead of the magnesium ion and the manganese this fluoride ion will go and bind with the enolase enzyme so once this enolase enzyme has been blocked then what will happen the subsequent the substrates that are there with respect to the glycolysis the three phosphoglycerate uh, then a dihydroxyacetone phosphate glycerol dihyd three phosphate and all these molecules start accumulating and finally the glucose now the glucose instead of entering into the straight glycolytic pathway where it is blocked by the fluorosis 
the glucose molecule will enter into an alternative pathway called as the polyol pathway in the polyol it will help in the synthesis of uh, certain molecules such as the uh, galactitol sorbitol aldactol all these molecules are synthesized these molecules once it gets accumulated in the cytosolic compartment of the cell it is highly hygroscopic in nature so this molecule these uh, uh, polyol molecules once it absorbs the water component that is there in the cytosolic compartment of the cell it swells once it swells then what will happen be it the neuropathy nephropathy retinopathy these things to happen where there will be transmission of light may not be proper and it will lead to opacity of the lens material retina so uh, conduction of the nerve impulse in the retina will get affected peripheral nerve impulse will be affected yeah, the glomerular basement membrane of the kidney will be affected so the filtration of the kidneys will be affected so that uh, various uh, other damages to happen uh, with respect to these uh, uh, components of the body so that ultimately it will lead to the damage the long standing effects that is the microvascular complications will be resulted with respect to the chronic exposure to the fluoride so uh, moving ahead Uh, considering the available evidence do you recommend any specific interventions or treatment strategies for individuals affected by both fluorosis and blood sugar dysregulation such as lifestyle modification or targeted therapies yeah there are two things here one is uh, diabetes is a multifaceted disease so it has got hormonal uh, regulation it has got uh, dietary regulation lifestyle modifications and so many other factors are involved with respect to the diabetes so once the diabetes are under control the intricate mechanism that is happening in the cell can be controlled with little exposure or avoiding the exposure to the uh, high fluoride or by uh, taking an action against which the fluoride entry into the cells and other things can be avoided so let me speak few things about the di- diabetes so initially then let me come to the uh, fluoride so the diabetes as we all know there are uh, four types of diabetes type 1 type 2 gestational diabetes mellitus and other types of diabetes mellitus the type 1 diabetes it is due to the deficiency of the insulin obviously there will be deficiency of the insulin that uh, do not happen with respect to the beta cells of the langerhans so there is a recession between the demand as well as to the supply of the insulin with respect to the type 2 diabetes so there will be a receptor defect where the insulin receptors will be defective so that regulation of blood glucose do not happen type 3 gestational diabetes it is a transient occurs during the pregnancy and goes off once the pregnancy but it is a pre diabetic condition so these people should be very careful once the pregnancy is uh, pregnancy is taken care of the other types are due to the counter regulatory hormones that are there in our body be it the thyroid hormones be it uh, the corticotropic hormones be it the adrenaline noradrenaline that is epinephrine and norepinephrine or the various other steroid hormones that are there in our body now for control of the diabetes mellitus the dictum the thumb rule is eat less and walk more the sedentary lifestyle and other things needs to be taken care with respect to the control of diabetes irrespective of type 1 or type 2 the lifestyle modifications such as the smoking alcohol and various other things the obesity needs to be taken care so all these things waist hip ratio needs to be maintained to be less than 1 so that uh, the uh, postponement of the diabetes can be taken care by the cause if it is genetics that are involved with respect to the parenthood and other things so uh, there is uh, a lot of chances that the siblings are going to get the diabetes mellitus uh, the offsprings are going to get the diabetes mellitus so for these things we can't avoid because the genetic mutations has already might have already been happened in the diabetes in the insulin gene or various other counter regulatory hormones that are related with the diabetes mellitus so this is with respect to the diabetes the birds view with respect to the diabetes so lifestyle modifications dietary control uh, regular exercise reducing the stress these are some of the things that needs to be controlled and uh, once this diabetes is controlled the microvascular complications of the pathies that are involved with the diabetes so that is the uh, retinopathy neuropathy nephropathy cardiopathy all these dermopathy all these pathies can be postponed to certain extent that is it has been observed that any person who is having a diabetes of more than 5 to 10 years are known to get these pathies in future 
So this is with respect to the diaphragms. Let me come back to the fluorosis. As I have told you, this fluorosis, fluoride, is the one that is going to inhibit the enolase enzyme, which is the main uh, enzyme which is involved with the causation of the diabetes mellitus. So to avoid entry of the excess fluoride, there are various other dietary sources. Of late, um, uh, we have started consumption of tomatoes, which are rich in this uh, fluoride, and cabbage, which are rich in fluoride. So these diets needs to be avoided. And RO water has to be consumed more, either for cooking or for various other things, we need to use this type of RO water. Because three types of water we will be using regularly. One is for uh, washing of the clothes and other things, where the fluoride that has been there will get in contact with the clothes to the skin and it gets absorbed. And direct consumption of the fluoride or for the various other things, the cooking purpose and other things, where we will be using the non-fluoridated water. The main disadvantage with respect to the <coughs> RO system that we are using as on date, the molecules which has got the same uh, 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 composition that of the fluoride will also get filtered out. So these ions are also involved with the various other enzyme activities and those ions are also having an impact on the diabetes mellitus or the insulin synthesizing gene. So, we should be very careful with respect to when we are selecting or using the uh, RO filters that we are going to use. Then, how to prevent these things? Consumption of more of the tamarind instead of the tomatoes with respect to the diet. Consumption of drumstick, drumstick leaves. So, uh, these are some of the things, uh, jaggery instead in place of sugar. So, these are some of the things which we can think of so that which will avoid entry of the fluoride or even if the concentration of the fluoride and other things are less in this. Then it has been, studies have been documented that the consumption of tea increases the fluoride absorption in our body because the tea leaves has got the highest concentration of the fluoride with respect to the other leaves that we consume regularly. If you are a regular tea consumption person and if you are already been exposed to the high fluoride concentration, so we should try to avoid consumption of tea to certain extent to as far as possible and it has been observed that green tea is one of the better uh, option as a substitute for this and again it is a controversial statement because still we are not clear whether this green tea is protective against the fluoride exposure or not. So these are some of the diets that we should we need to concentrate upon. Uh, and professor, um... What gaps or limitations still exist in our understanding of how fluorescence impacts blood sugar regulation? Which areas of research do you believe should be prioritized to address these gaps? Ma'am, uh, one is at the population level, at the community level, the knowledge, attitude, behavior, as well as the education with respect to the fluoride needs to be addressed upon. School health education needs to be taken care and the community health and the population uh, uh, education needs to be taken care of with respect to the fluoride. Next, at the scientific level, the scientist needs to concentrate more on the fluoride at the cellular level, be it the, uh, the uh, cell culture or once it has entered into the body, to what extent this fluoride is going to mutate the DNA, where it will be transmitted to the RNA to the protein uh, so that the insulin or the counter-regulatory insulins are going to get affected. So these are the things the scientific community needs to concentrate now in the population who are exposed to the high fluoride concentration on the chronicity of the fluoride exposure. Because as on date, the water table, wherever we see the water table has crossed more than 700 to 800 feet. So that is the water that we are consuming. And it has been, studies has been documented that the deeper the uh, level of the water that we consume, the higher the fluoride concentration because the fluoride that is there in the uh, stones, earth crust, all these things will get mixed. It will uh, get endosmosed into the water that we are going to consume and it is the water that we will be consuming. So these are some of the concerns with respect to the scientific, with respect to the population that we need to address upon. Yes, Professor. And... Uh... Now, considering the potential impact of chronic fluoride exposure on blood sugar regulation, how important it is 
for healthcare professionals to include fluorosis assessment and management as part of routine diabetes care yeah so in addition to the routine uh, uh, examination that is done with respect to the diabetes there is the whether it is the fasting blood glucose postprandial blood glucose random blood glucose hba1c or of late the fructosamine is also one of the one that is a glycated albumin is uh, also an important molecule that has been included by various centers who are treating the diabetes mellitus the lipid profile and various other things that are involved uh, with the diabetic evaluation in addition to this the regular fluoride estimation uh, with respect to the population who are exposed that to chronic exposed to the fluoride also needs to be assessed so that the impact of the fluoride on the insulin in addition to the insulin estimation the c peptide estimation so in addition to this the fluoride also needs to be estimated to say that yes uh, person x is exposed is getting exposed more to the fluoride your levels are getting more so that there is a chance that the impact of uh, this fluoride on the various other cellular enzymes are going to get affected so it is better you start consuming tamarind instead of uh, these tomatoes and other things the health education needs to be done at the treating uh, physician or at the family physician level itself uh, so professor uh, my last question is uh, are there any promising preventive measures or management approaches yes number 1 uh, usage of uh, rvo water number 2 inst- uh, to replace uh, tomatoes with the tamarind consumption of uh, drumstick drumstick leaves and other things consumption of green leafy vegetable sprouted grains uh, avoiding exposure to the uh, high fluoride filtration of the water there are various uh, methods that are available for filtration of the water be it the drinking water be it the uh, consumption water or even the cows and the buffaloes that are fed with the, the uh, water that also needs to be concerned and uh, the rvo water system should be taken care because the ones that enters into the buffaloes or cows that will get excreted through the milk so that also needs to be taken care yeah uh, now thank you professor shashidhar we have uh, arrived towards the end of this session and it was indeed very informative and interesting session so thank you for your time and invaluable insights thank you ma'am thank you thank you very much and a huge thank you to our audience for tuning in and before we conclude I want to bring your attention to the Medsana's platform, our vibrant hub that's redefining the healthcare landscape. It serves as an invaluable resource for professional doctors like you, offering opportunities to engage in meaningful discussions and connect with expert doctors and be part of advancement in healthcare. Why wait? Explore the Medsana's platform right now to make the most of these remarkable opportunities. Feel free to drop your comment in the section below if you have any questions. We'll be more than happy to provide you with the answers you seek. I am Dr. Harshita, your host, signing off. Bye-bye.